Hello and welcome to episode 113, Unlocking India's Military Space Potential, Policy, Law and Innovation. We have previously discussed on this podcast uh, primarily the aspects related to the policy law, which we have kickstarted very recently uh, on a very initial level. But uh, today we'll be taking a deep dive into a specific country's uh, military space potential. And without any delay, I would like to kickstart with the topic and today's guest, uh, Dr. Ranjana Kaul. Hi, Ranjana, ma'am. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Omkar. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, ma'am. I've been a big fan of your work uh, since I've been seeing your opinion pieces, uh, your, your, I think, uh, some of the posts that flash over uh, on the LinkedIn's, then your conferences views as well. And I think I was waiting for the right time uh, where we have an appreciable amount of audience to have an expert view like you, uh, because you know, it won't make uh, so much sense to have an expert like you when we had only 30 or 50 episodes, you know. So we have crossed 100 episodes. I, I believe like, you know, the, oh. uh, yeah, so now I, I believe your opinion will reach to a wider audience, especially here in uh, the NATO circle also, because the podcast is distributed across the uh, some of the NATO departments as well. So yeah, uh, before we, yeah, so before mm-hmm. we begin with the actual uh, session of uh, today's episode, Can you tell us briefly about your journey uh, as a space lawyer and an expert in general in this industry? Because I think your career has spanned over decades. uh, So it is it will be really interesting even for the students or research scholars who are listening to this podcast. It would be interesting uh, to know your journey as well. Um, So first and foremost, to understand, Omkar, that... uh, a degree, a LLM degree in international air and space law is a specialization after you complete a graduate degree. Okay. Uh, and that it should be a law graduate degree. Okay. So I did my LLB in India and in the Delhi University. I had, like any other Indian, not the slightest idea about international air law, much less space law. But by a quirk of fate, as it happened, my husband was posted to Montreal as the representative of India at the International Civil Aviation Organization. Because at the time he was posted in the Ministry of Civil Aviation, was dealing with those matters. and So I found myself uh, in Montreal for three years. Um, and after getting over the jet lag, basically, I had no idea what I would do with myself because I was in practice in Delhi. Yes. Anyhow, um, I found myself at a lunch and there I met uh, Justice Joseph Nuss. And Judge Nuss used to, at the time, he was presiding the Court of Appeals of Quebec Court. And he asked me whether I knew about international air law. And of course, my face betrayed the answer. And same for when he asked me if I knew anything about space law. Okay. So he told me that, all right, fine, I should make good use of my time. Clearly, I know nothing about international air and space law. And that he would uh, fix up an appointment with Professor Dempsey, Paul Dempsey, who was the director of the Institute of Air and Space Law at the McGill University. So, of course, I resisted any such uh, attempt to get me into further studies because I already had a PhD by then. Yeah. I was sort of mid-career, or a little bit more than mid-career in India. Anyhow, I ended up uh, at the McGill Institute and ended up doing this uh, LLM in international air and space law. And it it was it was intellectually so challenging in an overwhelming way. Yeah. I realized that, uh, good heavens, there is so much beyond what we know in India. In yes. any way, after three years, uh, uh, we came back uh, to India and I joined Dua Associates as a partner. But my first job upon starting was that my professor at McGill, which, who is uh, Professor Ram Jaku, and a doyen in uh, international space law, they represented Canada, which is his country now, Uh, at many international forums. And he said that uh, he did not know of anybody who was formally trained in these complex laws and that India has a very advanced space program. And he wanted that I should specialize in 
space law. So my dissertation for LLM was in a subject uh, involving uh, regulation of satellite telecommunications in India. Be that as it may, that journey started in the November of, uh, in the July of 2005, because I had to make a presentation at that time, the UN USA Office of Outer Space Affairs and the International Institute of Space Law, which by then I had become member, uh, were hosting, you know, the UN was trying to promote uh, the use of outer space or the benefits of outer space in the Asia Pacific region and encouraging national space laws to be established. So I was told that my job was first and foremost to go to Bangalore, where this entire top brass of these international institutions were, including ISRO. And I made a presentation on a blueprint for India's national space law in the June of 2005. At that time, of course, uh, there was no thinking about commercial space and any of that. And it caused a great lot of consternation um, amongst the uh, amongst the government uh, agencies, uh, the ISRO people there, and they wanted to know who I was and why I was saying completely uh, out of the box uh, propositions. Anyway, it all started there. And then finally, uh, by the end of that month, when I came back to Delhi, which is where I am based, it was only after the Chinese ASAT test that the think tank, the government think tanks were then uh, in a situation where they wanted to discuss space security and yes. uh, the implications and everything else related to it. So we would have all these, uh, well, there was nothing like a webinar back in the day. You actually met and you had discussions and produced documents and so forth. But I realized then that there was a gap uh, between the way uh, the government uh, folk that were there understood space or did not understand space the way that I understood it. But I also realized for myself that when I did the LLM, then, you know, the instruction or teaching of those space laws very peripherally deals with the military aspects. Yes. It deals with the peaceful use of outer space, which is to say, states to undertake non-adversarial activities in outer space, no activities against any other country. And so the complex nuances and understanding of the treaty in military context, I actually started doing it only out of my own realization that when I'm dealing with, for example, I used to go to IDSA, as it was called, the Parikar Institute, uh, of yes. uh, Defense Studies and Analysis, and the Center for Air Power and so forth, then there was the military folk wanting to understand what is this space. I, here was I with the LLM that taught me peaceful uses, but also the fact that I knew that the Outer Space Treaty and all the treaties govern all space activities, military, non-military or civil, and yes. commercial under the authorization of the state and authorization and continuing supervision. So my journey into understanding the international security and military user perspectives was a personal journey. Yes. And it took hours upon hours of research and reading. And of course, without Ram Jhaku, none of it would have been possible. Without an indulgent managing partner, Mr. Duar, he never asked me where I vanished for days on ends, what I'm doing and what I'm forever studying at 7.30 in the evening, I'd be looking at and reading something. He used to nod his head and walk past and let me be. But all of it has come together in a very wonderful way. And that is how I got also involved and interested to understand the finer nuances of the military and international security perspectives of the space treaties. So that is the short story. Interesting. That's, <laughs> that's quite interesting, I think, uh, because I think uh, you have had a, you know, kind of several crossovers and especially the military crossover that you mentioned. It is, it is very important. I think we are going to come to that point uh, later uh, when we are discussing because I had observed the fact over here, especially uh, now working here in Europe for almost seven years, uh, 
the military aspect was not that much considered even in the northern european states now but i think uh, we saw a kind of a different origin of space law here in europe uh, especially finland uh, generally it is the government who starts the space law and initiates things then in finland it was a private company i say because of whom the space law came into existence so yeah. i mean there are cases you know where actually the even the private sector has been responsible to initiate the military and the several aspect in the space industry uh, but yeah i mean there are several different such cases uh, that the one that you mention and i think we are going to dissect each each one of them possibly uh, i mean we just have mm-hmm. this one episode but definitely in future we might be able to uh, dissect it so coming to the actual i think the question set uh, uh, for today uh from from your perspective i would say what is the current status of india's military space program and how does it compare to other uh, global space powers because uh, we see that of course the indian market is uh, i mean of course there are companies which are there that is growing and but i see you know the way space is growing just because the launch cost is lower doesn't mean the value is higher so that is also the case Uh, so what is your complete perspective on this you know we are seeing a lot of diverse set which is growing but somehow i feel you know there is still a shape uh, that is needed shape is not there for the market at yet so what is, what is your thoughts on this so first and foremost i would say that to compare it with other space parks and you're talking of the big space parks i suppose yes and india you're comparing apples to oranges and the reason uh-huh. for that is yes yeah because if you're talking of the major space powers all of them established military space programs in 1972 when we established a space program or indeed in 1969 when japan uh, established its space program we were the only two countries that established civil space programs Japan had good reason why it did that and we had a good reason why we did that so what does that mean essentially that these dual use technology the very reason that we call it dual use is that these are these technologies were built for military purpose by united states and the ussr but there is nothing in the outer space treaty indeed in any other uh, treaty that uh, relates to outer space that says that you must use military technology only for military purpose Yeah. it doesn't say that you can use you cannot use military technology for any other purpose so that any other purpose is non military purpose or what we call civil yeah. so see. with the result that our uh, uh sense that we needed our armed forces also to be supported by satellite based systems for providing services and in particular communications secure communications or earth observation surveillance was very important because we shared a very long border uh, uh, which has very different geography it is very yes. difficult geography and it almost girdles india from west down to the uh, east on the land mass and of course there are threats we will always imagine that there will be threats on the oceanic side uh, you know in the other half of the circle yes so therefore that has happened only in consequence of the kargil report of 2000 yeah. after we were denied gps signals during the kargil war yeah and the sense that you know we this we cannot be in the same position again yes absolutely so our journey has started recently but our space program has for 50 years and more been a civil space program yes right and yeah. so our, at the point in time when india started speaking in sort of in the public there was an awareness in the public that you know yeah. space activities for peaceful purpose in india the default understanding was peaceful purpose meets civil space yes if civil space then therefore outer space the physical domain can only host civil activities yes and this is not supported by the treaties this yeah. interpretation is simply not supported by the treaties and it is prolific even as we speak today yes 
that is the first thing the mindset of how you are going to approach space yeah where you are convinced that peaceful purpose being civil absolutely that's the first hurdle that i have confronted <laughs> it's taken me um, you know hell of a lot of time i can tell you <laughs> the first time that right. i actually provided the precise meaning of mm. exclusively for peaceful purpose and peaceful purpose and surveillance satellite was in the february of this year okay. and all the a lot of the uh, defense people who were there i have known you know through this journey from 2006 7 onward and i said that after all these years of speaking to you yeah. i feel today some of you will immediately understand what i'm saying and they were absolutely yeah. surprised when i told them what and how that basis came about nice so you know your mindset is the first thing Absolutely. and the second part is that because we are used to terrestrial wars yes or air wars you know uh, we are applying that same methodology when we are looking at space yeah uh, so these are uh, based on sovereignty terrestrial wars terrestrial yes. laws but in outer space there is no sovereignty so they are very perplexed why is it that there is nothing definitive about the outer space treaties yeah Absolutely, not I an think, easy yeah. subject. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I agree with you on this, <laughs> and I think you know just a follow up on this, you know, because I believe uh, a lot of changes have taken place in the India's military space sector. So you know, as per uh, the kind of research that you have done, the kind of you know uh, projects that you have worked on, can you explain some of the key pointers that have uh, that have or are even shaping the India's military space sector and what role does government play in facilitating uh, the innovation for military space applications? Because we really see that uh, there are several initiatives from the government that are coming up at the moment, and how much does it basically contribute towards military space? Everything that has happened in military space is at the initiative of the government. This is the government sector. Yes. So. The- in the first and the initial years we have systematically established institutional structures and there are several institutional structures pertaining to all three services and everything that comes in between there is a deep uh, synergy between our space uh, administration the civil space administration and our program and whatever it is that the military requires by military i mean all i'm not saying armed forces but the military's uh, users and that is the way it cannot happen without complete coherence yes. between both arms of the government and it has always been like that it has always forever been like that including yes. i will tell you that the department of space is a huge support system for our ministry of external affairs as well yes in the in uh, in whatever happens in these domains and in those specific institutions in the un government is fully uh, you know in on the same page yes right absolutely and and so uh, when you're talking about what is the potential now and so forth well we have only just for the first time in a very uh, amplified way after the space reforms yes we have for example take the case of the satellite industries association and the indian space association yes. these are two new those are the unofficial forums where government government users both types all kinds and yes. our new space companies and other commercial companies are interacting you know without without any yes. uh, hesitation because or clearly the government is encouraging this yes and so how it will shape up what are the specific requirements it also includes how the procurement rules or how the contractual obligations will yes. be established for a synergy between our new space companies or our commercial space yes. companies established commercial space companies and the government yes it's a whole different domain take for example the fact that when you have a defense procurement it for terrestrial weapons Absolutely. and for terrestrial air, you know aircraft and so forth 
you are dealing with huge companies global companies yes so the way in which you will have your eligibility conditions and so forth is very different yes. than a startup where it has to raise funds on its own yeah it has to then pay back whatever it is i mean Absolutely. you know uh, a vc will want to exit in 5 7 years 10 years at a predetermined price yes and so perhaps you know they those that are the decision makers have to be educated also yeah absolutely i agree with you about the technology <laughs> what are you dealing with yes. it is not the same thing it is a very challenging yes. task uh, omkar and it's very easy to say yes but why can't we do it yeah no, it's I agree it's with uh, you. it's uh, everybody is a startup here yeah yeah yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> including Because, the government yeah. yes yes Yep, I, I mean you mentioned about the institutions point, and this is more of a personal question I would say, uh, from my side, uh, because uh, having associated with some of the insider risk cases here uh, in the in the space industry, so in India we uh, in the intelligence community especially we have an institution builder one of the prominent personalities I would say, late Rameshwar Nath Pal, you know. he was primary i would say a backbone or a strong pillar back then of the government to build institutions more more than an intelligence uh, community officer he was considered as a great institution builder for the intelligence community of india similarly do you see a set of people or a kind of you know a similar mindset that is integrating in the space industry of india at the moment because we see several institutions several of the i think uh, sub wings which are coming up you know like there is nsil there is in space there is idex you know i mean several dsas there so there are several institutions which are coming up so do you see this architecture uh, being kind of replicated uh, between the intelligence and space or is it something different or are, is there a set of well, people who are spearheading this look let me tell you, let me put it like this uh, that kao saab was dealing with uh, not dealing with space yeah that's true <laughs> yes yes <laughs> yeah. so now you have a set of people who what can i tell you uh like i said in february this year is the first time that i actually uh, articulated the meaning of exclusively yes. for peaceful purpose this that and the other yeah. and there were those that fully understood on the spot and yeah. they said why didn't you say so before i said because mentally you were not ready <laughs> but i used to talk to you i could see blank faces yeah. you used to just blank off and say pata nahi yeah. kya baat karti hai yes <laughs> but now you're ready you're receptive yeah yeah so this um uh, you know we need to have uh, it will come i'm very confident yeah. of it because i see a gradual and this yeah. gradual opening is happening because the mindset has expanded yeah the approach has expanded and there will emerge the equivalent of a kausa for space also <laughs> i'm fully confident <laughs> yeah absolutely that's that's what i wanted to know actually because uh, you know having read about him and I, i think we really need especially in a complex industry you need uh, such a leadership uh, which will take you not only on a sustainable path but it'll also look at you know several aspects of the nation because i think when we are dealing with space it's not only you know the peaceful purpose it's it's also the security the kind of you know employment it generates the kind of return it has basically it has to take a 360 degree perspective inside of it and i think you need good leaders you know kind of to spearhead such initiatives uh, so yeah but i got no, the answer no omkar you well, you know omkar it's not just industry first yes. and foremost it is about the nation nation absolutely yeah yes yes and the very fact that you are calling it dual use yes is telling you the complexity of the international security perspective and therefore your national security perspective yeah absolutely. and therefore your military use of perspective yes civil space has its role to play yeah. and it is it is the what should i say it is the foundational pillar yeah with many branches supporting the related uh, now in space Absolutely. the role of in space is nothing to do with the military yes it is to do with promotion of commercial space sector with yeah. focus of course on our startups its role is to because 
you know, international treaties are yes. as between sovereign states. Yes. The international treaty establishes relationship between sovereign states. They're That's not something. directly applicable to private entities, meaning an yes. individual like you and me or a private company. That's that something. relationship is established between the state and its private sector. Yes. And therefore, in the case of space, the uh, private or commercial space activities require to be undertaken under the authorization and continuing supervision of the state. Yes. So authorization, you understand, yes, I give you the permission, I authorize you, I give you a license, all that. Yes. But continuing supervision means from the moment that the asset is in orbit until that asset deorbits. Yes. So because there is liability attendant to it. And the state is also liable for Absolutely. any damage that that commercial space asset might cause or sustain yeah. indeed, sustain in outer space, airspace and on the surface of the earth. Yes. It's a very complex treaty to understand when you look at it from civil space perspective and military space perspective. Absolutely. And uh, as you just mentioned about the private sector, I mean, uh, you can answer it the way you want it in a brief manner also, because I know, you know, it's it's a growing, uh, we are at a, you know, growing stage, you know, at the moment as a, as a country, as a whole, uh, and especially respect to the kind of growth that is happening in the space applications, both in upstream and the downstream market. So uh, with respect to the private uh, sector of India, what do you think as an expert uh, working for several decades now, I would say, what are the gaps that you observe and how can the government, it's not only basically government, but also the private sector can basically help bridge it and try to, you know, kind of accelerate uh, the kind of innovation that is happening. I mean, we saw some of the, I mean, some initiatives coming out of like, you know, the FDI, uh, low, lower GSTs and all uh, these initiatives from the government side. So what more can be done basically to accelerate the growth of the Indian space sector? both from the private and the government side? So as far as the private sector is concerned, you look at it in two dimensions. One is the commercial sector of around 750 companies or so, which have been part of the government, that is to say ISRO procurement system. Okay. ISRO has been sourcing goods and services from its private sector. Out of these 750, let's say around 150, 175 are the core. And some of them are, are legacy engineering companies. They've been around for over 100 yes. years, some of them. And these are well-known names, right? Yes. LNT and uh, Tata's and Walchand and so forth, yes. all of those. What is the situation is that ISRO has traditionally worked very, very closely with its suppliers. Yes. Right? So they are primed and, uh, you know, to create whatever are the manufacturing or fabrications and so forth of very high specs that is required for a space program. So that has been happening since 72. So you have a huge sitting industry that is primed, yeah. ready to go. Now, following the space reform, the realignment of the national space program now has opened a commercial vertical yeah. such that very soon we will see a PSLV being launched, perhaps end of this year yes. or early next year, which is manufactured altogether fully in the private sector. Yes. It's an industry consortium of uh, HAL and LNT. Yes. And I'm absolutely waiting for that to happen. In the parallel, earlier in this year, in May of this year, the Tata Advanced Systems Limited, which has been a big supplier for our country, yes. uh, entered the space sector, but applications downstream. Yes. And it received authorization under the, you know, in space and this new, uh, it received authorization to procure a launch outside the country because we don't as yet have a space activities yeah. bill that has been enacted. And they procured a launch from SpaceX and they have established uh, an Earth observation satellite system. Yeah, I think it was satellite. And it is company. Yeah, yeah, with satellite. Yes, with satellite. Yes. And uh, it is it, the, the TASL one <laughs> is the name of that satellite, 
and it has the distinction of being the first commercial satellite, India's first commercial satellite that has yes. been entered in the register of space objects of India. Yes, absolutely. So now the next stage, as and when the law comes up, act, space activities law comes up, then we will yeah. have launches from India. Definitely. So we yeah. have to wait a little bit for that. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, we are a uh, little bit at the end of the episode now. Uh, but to wrap up the conversation, uh, you know, because a lot of my customers uh, based from Europe, I have been trying to, you know, help them connect with the customers in India. And there is a growing interest, especially from Europe. I mean, I don't know how things will evolve with the current uh, shift in the U.S. Uh, administration at the moment, but definitely there is a growing interest from Europe. A lot of companies are uh, trying to purchase components from the Indian market, the European companies. And that so this question basically is kind of coming uh, from my customer side, I would say, rather than personally just from me. So from your perspective, what is the message that you would like to give to the uh, companies trying to purchase or invest in the Indian market? And even to the Indian companies who are trying to basically scale their capabilities or try to, you know, go beyond uh, India as well. So all that we have been all that I have told you is basically that the building blocks on the supply side yes. are being established here. Absolutely. Yeah. Now is the question of creating a demand side. Demand, yes. And so that gap will be bridged by uh, collaborations, whether it is, you know, between new space, the old space and, you know, the emerging yes. established space, call them what you want. But there's a huge amount of interest on India's side also. In fact, at the recently concluded uh, Indian Space Conclave, which was uh, hosted by ISPA, the EU ambassador was there. He was one of the chief guests at the inaugural function there. I think that we will have enormous synergy between EU and India in the years to come, yes. irrespective Absolutely. of whatever it is that may be or may not be happening in the United States and its uh, yes. those dimensions. Yes. I think there is enormous potential. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, I, I, even I can see that because, I mean, there are loads of requests that I receive every week almost. Uh, to possibly, you know, connect with the people in India and, you know, kind of, you know, try to facilitate the conversation. And that's how I came to know, okay, you know, because we are not receiving anything possibly, you know, even Latin America for that matter, Latin American countries yes, are also absolutely. quite interested. Absolutely. People from South Korea yeah. as well, uh, which are yeah. very much interested actually. And I, I, I hope to see, you know, much more such growth happening. Uh, because I think we really have that uh, capacity to build. Uh, someday, I think, a week before or something, I was watching something related to manufacturing. And, you know, in India, I think uh, the cost of labor and the quality of goods, it's even, the issue is much more sustainable and healthy than what we see in the manufacturing sector of China. It's just that we need to scale it up. I think the scaling is just needed in the Indian market. Uh, we have a huge yeah. pool of yeah. trained talent. All yes. our new space, uh, my young uh, friends whom uh, whom I've known since this yes. ecosystem emerged in 2010, long yes. before the reforms were even thought about. They have come from engineering colleges, which are not necessarily IIT. Yeah. <laughs> they have come from across the country, and I have advised many of them. I have also advised the Tatas on this uh, uh, satellite that was uh, launched in May. Such energy. Yeah. Do you think? Are you surprised that all our companies here have their R and D and all everything yes. that goes with it here in India? There's there's yes. a good reason for it. Absolutely. It's not yeah. that it is cheap. It is that yes. it's there. There. And yeah. it's highly skilled and talented. Yes, absolutely. No, definitely. I I'm I'm really very much hopeful and uh, very much. Positive. I'm very. I'm 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 yeah. convinced that this is going to yes. be huge. Yes, and yes, absolutely. beneficial to. Uh, yeah. Uh, all the countries that want to collaborate with each other and pursue peaceful use of outer yes. space. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am, again, uh, for such wonderful insights. 
and i believe of course you know we we have this uh, limited time uh, where we had to cover as much as possible but in future definitely i hope to uh, host you again on the podcast for several such wide variety of topics because i believe space law policy and innovation the tracks actually go hand in hand with not only india mm-hmm. but there are several other countries even like uh, yeah. in latin america uh, even in europe africa? or even uh, uh, africa. yeah africa as well as well yes absolutely and and also uh, the oceania yes. indo pacific countries indo pacific countries yes yeah. yeah so definitely looking forward to you know such engagements again in the future with you thank you very much ma'am thank you omkar it was lovely talking to you yes bye